Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us online. Um, this is Mary Ellen Large from Deep Foundations Institute. Um, I would I would be very grateful if somebody could just pop a, a chat or a question over to to me just to make sure that you can hear. Um, so if somebody who's, who's joined us online, we have we're lucky to have um, 88 people already um, logged in. So if somebody could just chat me and let me know you can hear, that would be great. And we're getting ready to start the broadcast in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. So we're going to start out with Dr. Wright. Uh, we'll give a quick history of the uh, problem and discussion, and then we'll go into our software providers who will discuss briefly how they attacked the problem and had some solutions. So for the benefit of our guests joining by webinar, I will give some introductions. Um, everybody here got to see Dr. Wright's presentation yesterday, but uh, for our guests, Dr. Wright is a professional engineer with 39 years of teaching and geotechnical experience and at the University of Texas at Austin. He retired in 2008 and is active in consulting and relaxing. So everybody please welcome Dr. Stephen Wright. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I guess, um, John and I are the ones that are responsible for this problem. And I was going to just give you a little bit of background of why this was selected and chosen for this session. There we go. It involves a soil nail wall that's about 300 feet in total length. Um, the total height of the slope and the maximum cross section is about 40 feet and it was the upper about 20 feet or so that needed to be stabilized. The slope's about a 75 degree slope. This was done as part of the development for um, Hendrick, Motor, uh, Hendrick Subaru in Hoover, Alabama. Um, I don't have any pictures of the completed site, but if you go on the website and look up uh, Hendrick Subaru in Hoover, Alabama, you'll see the completed facility behind their car dealership. <clears throat> so one of the, the characteristics of this problem is that they had a very narrow zone at the top of the slope that they needed to work within. The property line was set back just nine feet from the top of the slope, and they needed to stabilize this slope without hopefully encroaching uh, on the neighboring property at the top of the slope. <clears throat> and the initial design, Hayward Baker uh, selected some fairly steeply inclined soil nails. They were steeply inclined to keep them within the limits of the property, and that's the reason they ended up as, as steep as they did. This configuration of nails was analyzed by Hayward Baker using the Slope W software. Uh, it found a critical slip surface as shown here and a factor of safety about 1.5, which was the target factor of safety for this slope. When we looked at the results of the analysis with Slope W, we found that in the process of searching out the critical slip surface, 
it looked at, at a little over 200 slip surfaces, was successful in computing factors of safety for about 175 of those. However, there were 30 in which Slope W reported no solution. It was due to convergence issues. <clears throat> um, this sort of as a summary of what I've just said, it was due to the steeply dipping soil nails and critical slip surface where Hayward Baker felt that there may be some problems with the stability analysis. They were concerned about whether the results they had with Slope W were meaningful, and they asked me if I would take a look at the analyses and perform some independent analysis and see if I agreed with the factor of safety of one and a half that was being reported for the slope. Whenever I'm making a comparison with some other program and some other analysis, I always, first of all, try and analyze the problem exactly as they did with the other software. I got a factor of safety of about 1.5, which is also what Slope W had reported for the slope. So I, I at least knew I was solving the same problem. Very similar results with both, both software for that slip surface. However, as we began to look at other slip surfaces, we found that that wasn't really the slip surface of interest. It wasn't the one that had the lowest factor of safety. For example, here's one, and this is one that I just selected sort of arbitrarily, the factor of safety is about 1.3, well below the one and a half. And this isn't the lowest factor of safety. There were other even shallower surfaces that gave even lower factors of safety. <clears throat> so as a consequence of this, Hayward Baker realized that their initial design with the steeply inclined nails was, did not have a factor of safety of one and a half, went back and relooked at the design and uh, ended up using much less steeply inclined nails that would provide the, f the desired factor of safety without the non-convergence issues. Um, one of the things that I've concluded from this, and I think I mentioned yesterday, it's very important that whatever software you're using reports all the details of the computation, because we could look at the results from Slope W and see that it had failed to successfully compute the factor of safety for a number of slip surfaces. And it's important that the software gives you as much information as possible so you can look at the solution and determine whether you got a meaningful solution or not. This is the final design that Hayward Baker had come up with. Um, I, I wasn't involved in the final design. This is what they came up with, and I think the panelists have maybe seen this design. Some of them, at least, have seen what Hayward Baker came up with. I, I didn't do any additional analysis of this redesign. Uh, I'll just show you a, a few brief photos of the construction of the wall. You may see some of these again. This is a construction in progress, uh, nailing that upper portion of wall, which is, I think, around 20 feet. Shows some more of the wall, some more of the wall. You can maybe see the roof back there of the adjoining property, so it was real close to this, the top of this wall. My observations from this, and this is my final slide, is by using two different software programs, and again, I'm just reiterating what I said yesterday, it helped us to identify problems with the analysis from one of these pieces of software. You want to be very careful of and aware of that the software may fail to compute the factor of safety for some of the slip surfaces that are tried. You need to know why it failed to compute those. If it's a slip surface that goes through rock or extremely strong material, it may fail. That's okay. It may also fail to compute the factor of safety because of inadequacies in the numerical solution for the factor of safety. You need to know why it didn't compute factor of safety for certain slip surfaces. And my final message is you have to understand what's happening with this software in order to, to know what it means. And with that, uh, Chris, I'll turn it over to the panel. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Okay, so we're going to hold questions till the end after the providers have made their presentations and keep things moving. The first software provider will be Varun. Varun is a senior geomechanics engineer with Itasca. He specializes in earthquake engineering and soil dynamics. 
Uh, he's worked on projects with slope stability for open pit mines and seismic stability for a variety of structures. So Varun with Itasca is up first. Uh, I say still good morning, everyone. Uh, um, so I'm going to be talking about the solution that uh, and the approach that Itasca used to actually uh, attack this problem. Uh, as Professor Wright already showed details of the problem, I will not go very much in detail, but that's just showing the slope that was there, which is up to 37 feet high maximum, dipping around 75, 76 degrees, and about 283 to 300 feet wide. There was a 250 uh, pounds per square feet load at the back to account for these existing structures as well. And uh, there was a limitation that they didn't want to intrude into the property limits, so we couldn't go more than 7 to 11 feet from the slope crest uh, inside into, uh, to put the soil nails. Uh, the preferred method to design the support was using soil nails and short creed. And then the cut slope was initially simulated using limit equilibrium method as the problem was uh, uh, originally designed for a factor of safety of 1.5. And the original design was uh, using soil nails at 40 degrees inclination, mainly uh, to account for the fact that we didn't want soil nails going uh, into the other property. Uh, this was the information that was available to us. There were four boreholes. Uh, based on that, we had two soil types, one the residual soil at the top and the PWR soil. These were the main uh, layer, soil layers that needed to be stabilized because below that was good to very good rock. Uh, one good thing was there was no uh, groundwater table, so that uh, made it a little bit easier because we didn't have to consider pore pressures uh, in this case, we this plot just shows then the slope, uh, how it looked from the front that you saw in the picture as well. And these were the four sections that were analyzed. The way we uh, started solving the problem was using FLAX, which is Itasca's two dimensional finite difference continuum software. We used a relatively simple material model, which is more Coulomb, because those were the properties that were available, and for a first go, that was, that was good enough. The factor of safety analysis uh, done in these finite different uh, software is using shear strength reduction method, which is di different from limit equilibrium method. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, too. Uh, for ground reinforcement, we use structural elements that I'll also talk about, and the end goal we had was to have a practicable support solution. So in terms of cost and also it should be installable. Now, uh, coming back to the shear strength reduction method, uh, in limit equilibrium, we typically have these uh, assumed failure surfaces and then we use the method of slices to actually determine the factor of safety. The way we solve the problem is we do not make any assumptions at all. What we do is we set up the problem as it is and then we solve the problem and see whether that slope is stable or not. Now, if we want to find what is the factor of safety, what we do is we reduce the shear strength of all the materials by a certain strength reduction factor. So we could reduce the strength by a factor of 1.1, solve the problem, see if it's still stable or not. If it's still stable, solve, reduce the properties by a factor of 1.2, and then see again if it's stable or not. So let's say it's stable for a strength reduction of 1.1, but it's not stable when we reduce the properties to 1.2. We know the factor of safety is between 1.1 and 1.2. And then we can bracket this further, and there is an automated routine built in that can be used as well. The other option is we can manually, if we know what factor of safety we are aiming for, we can manually check for this, which is what we did in this problem, because we knew we were targeting a factor of safety of 1.5. We checked for our design for 1.5 and 1.6, and made sure that 1.5 was stable and a strength reduction of 1.6 was not stable so that we are not over-designing as well, which would be more expensive. The major advantages of shear strength reduction is, first, it can, it can produce multiple failure mechanisms and capture them well. This is just an example showing uh, a case where limit equilibrium method actually uh, said that the failure, uh, this failure surface, this global failure surface, had a factor of safety around 1.5. Uh, 
but running this in Flag, we got a factor of safety under one. And the reason was that there was a smaller failure mechanism on this side, which reduced the resistance on, on this side and resulted in an active edge type failure behind this sheet file wall. And then that triggered this global failure, thereby reducing its factor of safety. So such interacting failure mechanisms is something that Flag is really good at capturing. Another thing it can do is you can introduce as much complex ground behavior as you want. And then finally, as we'll see in this problem, you can get enhanced judgment from seeing realistic mechanisms. So if you look at the mechanism, you know how this thing is failing, you can accordingly design your ground support better. In terms of displacements, uh, the deformations are kinematically valid. We are not assuming any slip surfaces. So everything that is happening is how it would have really failed. And then since we get displacements also, if we use realistic stiffness values, we can also determine if the ultimate limit state is more important or if it's the service limit state that's more important. Because if we are getting three feet displacement but everything is stable, that necessarily doesn't mean that everything is okay. I mean, you might have a criteria that you shouldn't have displacement in excess of one feet and then that, wouldn't, that solution wouldn't work for you. And finally, you can incorporate uh, full ground support. You can have full soil structure interaction. The structural reactions are generated by full interaction and are not just the ultimate values. And one frequent complaint that used to be there is that you can't have, mul you can't show multiple factors of safety as in if you wanted to know how much of a volume of slope will move if you wanted to get, a, if you were looking for a factor of safety 1.5. That's no longer a limitation either. You can actually generate a factor of safety contour map like this, which will show you depending on what strength reduction factor you use, how much of a volume would move. So for a small failure surface, the lowest factor of safety is 1.25 here, but a much bigger, if you had a strength less than uh, 1.5 times the current values, you would get a much deeper failure surface as seen here. Uh, these are the structural elements that are available in FLAC. We have surface support elements like beams liners, we have shear support elements to model things like cables and strips. And then we have shear and normal support for things like piles, which also have bending resistance. You can tie them together and you can account for spacing in the third dimension by using scaling. And that flag does automatically. The ones we used for this problem were beams for modeling the short treat uh, because the bending resistance is what we cared about. We had actual peak and the residual strength, and then we had plastic moments for the bending resistance. Uh, for soil nails, we used cables. Uh, we had the tensile strength of the cable. We also had shear strength of the grout, which is around the cable, and you can pre-tension them if you need, but that was not needed in this case. Here is how the problem looks like. We initially assumed that plane strain conditions were valid and it's not a true 3D problem, so we could use a 2D uh, method. There is no water table, as I mentioned before, and we didn't use any tensile strength or dilation for any of the materials. When we started solving the problem, we observed a failure surface actually running all the way through the rock, and that didn't seem realistic because it's in good quality rock. So we went back, looked at the logs, and concluded that the cohesion only value of 2,000 uh, pounds yeah, PSF, sorry, this should be PSF, was actually not realistic while using a zero friction angle. So we then increased the friction angle to a more realistic value of 30 degrees, and that inhibited the failure in the rock. Uh, we ran the simulations, as I mentioned, you're using shear strength reduction method, one for a case strength reduction of 1.5 and one with 1.6, and then we changed our design so that we achieved a a uh, factor of safety of 1.5. So for that case, it was all stable, but when we reduced the strength by a factor of 1.6, the slope would start moving. So that basically is how we, we define factor of safety. And this is what we, what we obtained. Uh, the properties we used for soil nails, we used a whole diameter of four inches, uh, typical number eight grade 60 bars. They were fully grouted, and we only considered XL tensile forces in the design. We, we ignored any bending resistance of those soil nails, which is what uh, 
the, the design recommendation is because if you have that additional resistance, that's good to have, but we didn't want to rely on that. And we used an out of plane spacing of about five to six feet, our grout bond strength of 1340 pounds per feet, and 47 kips actual capacity for the, for the nail itself. We also used short treat for the facing, uh, used uh, the short treat modulus, a thickness of four inches, used the peak yield strength of 41.7 kips, and a plastic moment capacity of 280 feet, uh, pound feet. This is how a stable case looks like. So these are the different three different layers. These are our soil nail. Uh, this is a failure surface. This is that's beginning to form, but it's quite not fully formed. You can also plot the moment, uh, the bending moment in the facing. You can be also plotting the displacement, oh, sorry, the velocity vectors on the facing. And then we are also plotting the actual loads in the cables. So you can identify the failure surface that's forming and then the best way to determine everything is indeed stable is actually also plot displacement at different locations at the crest of the slope. And this just shows all those displacements and you can see that after solving all of those displacements kind of plateau, which means nothing is moving anymore. And even though they are not real displacements anymore because we reduced the strength by a factor of 1.5, they still serve as good indicators of stability. So you can see that everything is less than an, an inch or so, uh, if, even after, uh, after basically we have solved the model and the model has reached equilibrium. This is the final design we came up with for the four sections. So we, uh, we were able to achieve factor of safety of 1.5 with soil nails which were 15 degrees inclination. Uh, these were the number of soil nails we used and the, where the section was uh, higher where the, 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 the thickness of the soil layers which were failing was higher, we needed more soil nails. And the spacing out of plane was between five to six feet. This is just to show the mechanism. Uh, here you can see the, the shallow nails and here you can see the steep nails. And just looking at the failure surface now, you can get an idea why steeper nails have a problem. I mean, in case of shallower nails, you can see there is an angle at which the failure surface intersects. The, the soil nails. So when the failure, the, the soil tries to move, there is some actual capacity then the, that the male, nail can generate to actually limit this movement. Because we are not considering bending, in case of steeper inclination, the failure surface almost hits the soil nails at 90 degrees angle. So since there is no bending resistance, it's not going to be able to inhibit it that way. Another thing you can look at is the direction how the facing is moving. So with shallower nails, the facing kind of pulls directly along the actual direction of the nails. So you mobilize the full resistance. But if these nails are at a steeper angle, it only mobilizes partial capacity because you're pulling them at an angle. So just by looking at this, you can get a good idea of how your failure is actually progressing and how you should design. So you, we knew right away that the steeper nails are not going to work and the shallower nail inclination is actually the way forward. Uh, in terms of cons of this, using this approach, there may be a little steeper learning curve for new users. Solution time can be a little longer than typical limit equilibrium models. Uh, but this, these problems still ran in a few minutes. And then if you use the automated procedure for factor of safety, you may use a little, need a little bit more time. But in this case, since we only needed 1.5 and 1.6, we could solve the whole thing in like two, three minutes for, for each uh, section. Uh, future improvements, uh, we could in incorporating real rock material strength, which we already included. Uh, putting, we could also put an interface between the short treat and the ground, uh, and then we could also model the excavation in stages. Uh, the advantages, we don't need to assume any slip surfaces, so no issues there. We get an understanding of failure mechanisms, which can provide very important insight and guidance how to optimize the reinforcement. You can predict multiple interacting failure mechanisms, which we didn't need here, though. Um, we have ground reinforcement, which actually captures soil structure interactions. You can account for 3D staggering easily, and you can do factor safety analysis automatically. We also went in and set up a 3D model. Here you can see if the 2D was not applicable, we could do the 3D, full 3D model. And here I'm just showing, for the sake of time, uh, 
how the failure looks like. So if we looked at the slope as it is, you can see that the, there's only a small failure happening at these three sections at the top, in the top residual layer. Whereas if we were to reduce the strength by a factor of 1.5, which is what we were trying to design and it was unsupported, you get both the layers failing as you can see here. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Varun. The next software provider will be Rock Science, and starting off for them will be Jeff Lamb. Jeff Lamb is a business development engineer for them, and he helps users with the use of software more efficiently. Following him will be Sina Javan. Dr. Javan is a geomechanics specialist at Rock Science. He holds his PhD from Queen's University in Civil Engineering, and Dr. Javan joined Rock Science in 2016, and he is one of the developers of Slide 2 2018 software and added spatial variability analysis to the software. So please help me welcome Jeff Lamb and Dr. Joan. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> it's great to be back here. Um, this is actually my, my favorite event of the year because we get to get together as pr practitioners and look at how we can analyze uh, the same problem using different approaches and and just discuss that we really appreciate um, DFI for putting this together. <clears throat> All right. So um, we basically all, all looked at the same problem. We had the same geometry, so I'm not going to go over the same uh, layout and arrangement again. I'm going to dive right into the, the method of analysis that we used. So the program that we used is slide two. Um, slide two is a 2D slope stability program for evaluating the stability and seepage conditions for soil and rock slopes. Um, the 2D limited equilibrium module in slide two was used for the stability analysis. Uh, we did not use the 2D finite element module in slide two because we assumed that the slope uh, was dry. So <clears throat> the way we built the model in slide two is we we're, were provided with um, a table of, uh, I guess, elevations and, and slope angles. So um, that's how we set up the model in this case. But if you had, say, a PDF file of your um, cross-section, or if you had an AutoCAD file, you can also generate your model using those methods. Um, and even if you have borehole data, um, you, can, you can set up your model using boreholes. <clears throat> the general assumptions that we used is the wall is internally stable. Um, and so on the left here, this is the model that uh, uh, was done using slope W. They had a focus point down here between the retaining wall and above the, the competent rock. And basically, it was a circular search that was done across the top. Um, so on the right, what we did is we, we basically assumed that the, the slip surface doesn't have to be circular. And we also set the focus to be between um, the, uh, from the crest here to the back of where the loading is, and ex exiting down here between the, the retaining wall and the, the rock. Um, other general assumptions that we used is that, um, yes, is the, the slope is dry. Um, in the, the PWR layer that there were no preferential slip planes or kinematically unstable conditions. We assumed that the same thing for the rock layer. And as I mentioned before, the slip surface does, does not have to be circular. Um, as for the soil nails, um, we assume that we are not using the, the shear resistance in the soil nails, um, which is typically done, which well, is the, the typical assumption behind the design of these type of retaining walls. And that the support force is applied um, parallel to the reinforcement direction. We assumed um, a polo, the ultimate polo resistance of 35 PSI 
for the rock layer, which was not provided in the, in the problem. And um, we just assumed that the borehole diameter um, is the same as the soil now, just to be um, very conservative, and that the plate resistance of the supports are the same as the nail string. <clears throat> so the first step that we did was we, we chose, we decided that we we're going to go ahead and run the problem in both 2D and 3D limit equilibrium. Um, we actually have uh, uh, 2D and 3D finite element, element analysis programs as well, um, RS2 and RS3, but we decided not to use those programs because we wanted to really focus just on the limit, limit equilibrium portion. And we decided to go with the, the Spencer method and using the non-circular Kuku search, which is um, a, a smart uh, meta heuristic searching method. Uh, step two is we created the, the model using no supports, using uh, low angle nails of 15 degrees, which was also used in the, the Hayward-Baker report, um, and then also with the high angle nails at uh, 53 degrees. And then we uh, redesigned the, the, the supports to achieve the target factor of 1.5. And then at the end, we uh, created the 3D model based off, based off of these 2D sections. So let's take a look at the analysis results. Um, this is section one, um, base case, without any support. So we can tell that, so we can right away, we can tell that uh, the slope is unstable. We're getting a factor of safety of 0.84. And uh, the slip surface actually looks more uh, planar when we let the program go and just, you know, let it, just so that it's free to choose and iterate through the different shapes. And I'm only going to show section one um, because it's, we have four sections and there's four cases for each of the sections, so it's going to take a lot of time to go through all of it. So that's section one, and then now going into the, the second case using 15 degree nails, um, nails that are uh, inclined at 15 degrees, we, we got a factor of safety of uh, 1.3. And using the high angle nails, we actually got a lower factor of safety. Um, with the, the higher angle nails, they are allowed to develop a higher um, bond strength, um, I guess a higher, because they, they are longer, they, they have more embedment length, so they develop a higher uh, capacity for pull-out resistance. But despite that, um, we're still getting a lower factor of safety, and that is because of the, the way the nails are inclined, and we'll get more into that later. So for the, re for the redesign, um, all we did, um, we didn't want to change it too much, so all we did is we realized we just needed, we just needed to increase the bond strength of these nails, so we just we just up up the size to number 11 nails, and uh, the, the 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 spacing for these nails, um, uh, I guess horizontally, stayed the same for sections one and two. For sections three and four, we we had to um, bring the spacing down to three feet uh, horizontally um, to bring the factor of safety up to uh, 1.5. All right, so uh, when we redesigned it um, with, with those parameters um, in, for section one, we were, we were able to get a factor of safety of 1.5 simply by changing the nail, uh, the soil nail size. And here is just a summary of the results we got. Um, so just to quickly go through these with no supports for section one, um, actually, for all of these sections, is below one. Using the low angle nails and using, um, I guess, using the non-circular surface, we got the factor of safety to go below 1.5. Uh, with the high angle nails, it's actually even less than the low angle nail case. And then when we redesigned it, we were able to get a factor of safety higher than 1.5. Um, and, and here are just the some of the analysis advantages and weaknesses behind 2D limit equilibrium. The advantage is that this is a, an approach that, that we have the most experience with. We're very comfortable with it. Uh, the formulation is easy to understand. 
Um, you can run it on basically any computer. It's very quick. And because it's quick, you can run uh, sensitivity analyses um, very easily and quickly. You can run um, probabilistic, probabilistic design on it also um, quite relatively quickly. And we are all familiar with the material properties behind limit equilibrium, behind Mohr Coulomb, which is the most common one that, that's usually used. The, the weaknesses is that we have to assume the soil mass has, can be broken down into slices. There's different assumptions to, to require to, for, 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 for equilibrium. Um, we're not looking at stress strain behavior. Um, no information on deformations. And, and the searching can be very challenging. Um, that's the, one of the weaknesses. And it requires um, experience. And some of the common mistakes we'll comment on is um, sometimes engineers don't have a good understanding of the different search techniques, techniques that you need to go and approach the problem from not just um, like a grid search, like a brute force technique, but you also combine it with a smart search technique. Um, sometimes you have overconfidence in the material boundaries and material layers. Uh, and, just, and I guess one thing we'll focus more on here is not paying attention to error codes. Okay, so just, um, um, I guess, a few slides here on, on error codes, which I think was one of, the main, one of the main reasons why we decided to kind of look at this problem in the first place is whenever you run these analyses, you do get a lot of error codes, but just because you're getting a lot of these error codes, it doesn't mean that there's necessarily something wrong with your, with your, mo with your model. Um, the, the main thing that you have to pay attention to is really um, the, the 111 errors, which are the non-convergence errors. And you have to make sure that when you run the model, um, you're getting the slip surfaces where it's it's important. So when we, when I, when I ran section one, um, the program generated 70,000 uh, slip surfaces. Um, 11,000 of those are valid, and 64,000 of those are invalid. At first, it seems alarming, but a lot of these actually are due to user settings. You, you can tell the program which ones are not acceptable, and then it'll generate an error code for that. So we'll we'll look more into the non-convergent surfaces. So for section one, the high angle nail case, when we show all surfaces, right away you realize that there's actually a zone here where actually we don't have any sliding surfaces. Um, we don't have actual results. And what the colors here show is uh, a safety map. So with orange being a lower factor of safety, the green being higher. And on the right here, this is uh, the, I guess the, the pink you're seeing um, that's actually the surfaces that did not converge. It, it, it's a lot, but despite that, we are still getting these valid surfaces. Um, so, so the question is, well, what's happening in here? And and what's happening is uh, the, the 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 support force is being concentrated at on this particular slice here. And if you take a look at the, even the vertical component of the support force, that it actually creates a destabilizing moment for this sliding surface. And that gives the program convergence issues. And that's the problem inherent behind um, steep, uh, steep supports. Um, it, it, can be, it can be very unstable using uh, limited equilibrium. So it's not, it's not an issue for a specific, specific software product. It's, really um, the method. And in slide, in slide, we're able to get around that by just simply um, turning on, just checking this box under project settings, telling the program to just apply support forces to intersize boundaries. That way it will, sp it will spread the force across the slices and you get a, a nicer distribution over here. When you do that, then you can see that Okay, this area gets filled in. We're, we're able to look at the we're, well. We're able to get a factor of safety safety for these slices now. And the difference between the, this case here on the left and the right is 14%. We, you know, on, on the left here we got something above one on well 1.1.08, and then on the right it's unstable. So um, that's our 2D analysis, and now I'll. Pass it over to Sina to go over go over our three three D model.
Thanks, Jeff. Um, for 3D model, actually, I'm going to be quick. We only have a couple of two minutes. Uh, for 3D model, uh, what I've done, we had this uh, plan view of the uh, section, and we had elevations for each section. So the easiest way to uh, create a 3D model was for each section, because we had the 2D model and we had the elevation, I created my own boreholes from the 2D model. So it's easy. You get the elevation of each layer. You have the top and bottom elevation of the borehole. And you just give it to the slide software, and it creates a nice and a smooth 3D geometry. It, it took me like 10 minutes, 15 minutes to create this geometry. It's very simple. And uh, adding boreholes, uh, it's going to uh, create a simple and a smooth geometry. So what? I've done, I created this uh, 3D geometry, and first I tried the case with no reinforcement. And as you can see, uh, we got the factor of 60.9, uh, not a stable. Uh, it, it's a combination of four different sections. But uh, you can see, because none of them are stable, the combination 3D uh, is not stable either. Then uh, I used the final uh, design. Uh, this is the original design, actually, for each section. To create a reinforcement pattern, it's not that obvious, but these are the reinforcement pattern for each section. We had the out-of-plane spacing for reinforcement layers, so I used those uh, out-of-plane spacings as well. And this is the case, the original case that we got factor of safety of 1.38, which is a little bit higher than the 2D case. Then uh, we used the steep uh, soil nail case, and we got the factor of safety of 1.1. Uh, still higher than the 2D case, but we were able to model it in 3D. And uh, the last one is the final design that I changed, as you can see here, because we changed the out of plane space into three meters, we uh, used a smaller space in between the soil nails. Uh, we got a factor of safety of 1.59, about 1.6. The original one in 2D was 1.5. So we were able to uh, get this factor of safety in 3D as well. So there are different advantages and disadvantages. I only have, I don't have time. So uh, the only advantage that this 3D modeling had was, first of all, it was very easy to create a model using 2D sections. And at the end, we used the cuckoo search and we got the same answer, almost the same answer, a little bit higher compared to the 2D case. Thank you, gentlemen. Our next presenter is Mitchell Bosch from Bentley Systems. Mitchell is an application engineer working at Bentley. He has a geotechnical engineering degree and a growing interest in geotechnical engineering. His role with Bentley consists of training, content development, and user success. Everybody, please welcome Mitchell. Thanks, Chris. All right, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, for everyone who saw Soil Vision and expects to see Murray, you got the new and improved version right here. So um, happy to be here. Honored to speak in front of all of you uh, very smart people. So. so today I'll be speaking about um, Soil Vision software used in the LEM analysis for this project, but also I'll touch on Plaxis results as well. So as part of Bentley's geotechnical group, we have access to both soil vision and plaxis, and um, we can use that in this case to show the results of, of both. And um, we'll mo more so focus on the soil vision results, but we uh, will look briefly at a comparison between plaxis and soil vision near the end. So here's a, a little outline of what we'll be going over. Um, so the method of analysis used, uh, this is something that we've, I believe, has been covered a little bit in uh, the presentations this week. but uh, the three methods for slope stability analysis, we have the limited, limited equilibrium method. So that's what we've, we've used with the soil vision analysis. And there's enhanced limit equilibrium and shear strength reduction. So the SV slope 2D and 3D limit equilibrium method uh, was used for the slope stability analysis. And it calculates the factor of safety, the probability of unsatisfactory performance, and the reliability index. So we've just focused on the FOS today. 
uh, material strength model used was Moore Coulomb, and Morgan Stern Price and GLE methods were used for calculation. And then just to note there that Plaxis performs the strength reduction find an element method analysis. So the analysis procedure we used, very similar to rock science, was um, using SV slope in our case. First, defining the model settings. So this includes setting your search method. We used for not or for for circular analysis, an entry and exit search method was used, and for non-circular, a cuckoo search was used. Uh, as I mentioned, the MP and GLE calculation methods, and the convergence settings in 2D was 100 slices. So once these settings are set, we can see that uh, we follow the, the workflow there. Um, I'm looking for that red dot, but I don't see it. <laughs> Anyways, we have uh, we have our geometry that we set. Next, we go up to our, our material properties, setting those, and then assigning those to our, our regions, followed by applying the distributed loading and setting your entry and exit ranges, and finally setting your anchor design, your support design. So here are some of the assumptions that we've used, or that we've assumed for this project. It's okay, the mouse is fine. Yeah, thanks. So some of the assumptions that we have for this project, uh, we assume the bond strengths are based on assumed material types. So based on the Murkulum material properties that we are given, we assume that the residual material was a silty sand, something like that. Uh, the PWR being a weathered rock and the rock material being a rock. Uh, we assume that the equipment would be able to accommodate the varying lengths and support types, as well as steeper inclination would facilitate gravity grouting. Uh, also, the support density would not jeopardize slope stability. So um, using um, what was recommended by the Federal Highway Administration of a 3.5 foot minimum spacing, we assume that this wouldn't have an effect on um, overlapping stress regions on uh, stability. One thing that we also assumed was that the absence of supports and, and facing in a, over the rock layer would not result in erosion problems because we're assuming that the rock layer is competent enough uh, to not have those, those um, erosion problems. <laughs> One thing we did not assume was a higher bond value in the rock layer. So we used the same bond value. I'll show those in the next slide. Um, but we increased the bond strength by assuming a, a larger uh, hole diameter. So here are the, the support properties that were used. So we have soil nail, soil nail is in rock, and the end anchored supports. End anchored supports I'll, I'll talk a little bit about as we, as we go along, but those were used in a case when the soil nails were not uh, satisfactory for the support design. Uh, just a couple things to note here. So the bond values used were 19 PSI for both the soil nails, and um, these were taken from the U.S. Department of Transportation and Federal Highway Administration. So now we'll get into the results, and how I've presented these are section by section. So we'll look at the geometry and the support design for each section. Each section differs a little bit, so to accommodate the, the 1.5 factor of safety criteria. So the first section being from zero to 100 feet along the slope. And what we see here is we use three soil nails spaced four feet out of plane and with a vertical four foot spacing as well. So in this case, this is where I mentioned that we assumed that there would be no erosion problems in the rock layer and therefore no support needed in that area. The factors of safety are shown in the tables uh, around here. So previous to support design, we had quite low factors of safety, and then moving on to the support design factor of safety, uh, we achieved uh, the required 1.5 minimum. So a little bit more information here. We found that the inclination had a significant impact on the factor of safety in this case. Uh, this was done through a parametric study varying the angle of inclination. So seeing that, uh, well, considering comparison between normal to the slope, an inclination of roughly 14 degrees, was not as impactful on the factor of safety than this uh, 30 degrees. Second here is the, the second section. And one thing to note too is that comparing a circular and non-circular failure for all the sections, non-circular was always the lowest factor of safety. 
And again, this was found using the cuckoo search method. So if I if I look at this, we're using only soil nails in this case, but we've increased this or we've decreased the spacing, increased the density of the soil nails in the lower three, so as to mitigate the soil or the slope failure of that large failure plane. Now they've also been uh, the angle of inclination was also decreased or sorry increased lower from horizontal, um, and we can see the reason being that more of the support is more of the, the force is being applied on that critical failure, so it's taking more uh, it's taking more of that force. So a bit more information just on that final design, a summary here. Uh, other things to note, and this we didn't really cover this with the other groups, um, and it may not be very pertinent unless we're looking at a cost analysis, but I've broken it down into, for each section, the density of, of uh, soil nails and, and the linear length of material that would be required. So if we were doing a, a cost analysis, we have these numbers. In this case, we're looking at, for this section, uh, the total soil nail length required per 100 feet of slope length at this dimension would be that 2350. And just another note here too is that the, the 20 and 30 degrees, we're doing a, a parametric study of the inclination variability of those two did not really have a significant impact in this case other than those bottom three anchors. So it depended on where they were with respect to what failure planes were, were found. Section three next. So here we have an example when soil nails at minimum spacing. So we're talking uh, a 3.5 vertical and 3.5 out of plane spacing was not sufficient in obtaining that 1.5 factor of safety. So what was done to mitigate this was to add end anchored supports. And these have uh, a higher tensile strength that reinforce the slope. So adding these in in place of soil nails allowed us to increase the spacing. So we can notice here that the out of plane spacing has been increased to five feet and the vertical spacing is increased to four feet. So at this 29 degree uh, inclination, we were able to find a desirable factor of safety. Now I believe if I, I'll just touch on this here. Uh, the sensitivity analysis showed 29 degrees as the most effective inclination for both calculation methods. So I think in my next slide, I can just show the sensitivity analysis done for, for the angle of inclination for all these designs. Oh, I didn't make it in. <laughs> um, so the section four here, so 190 feet to the end, we looked at uh, also using soil nails was not sufficient in this case, so we had to implement two end anchored supports. And something interesting about this one was that using using an end anchored support, so a, a higher strength support type as the bottom support, we can see here, this then pushed the, the failure plane upwards and it was interesting to find where the second end anchored support was needed to, to get that desirable 1.5 factor of safety. So moving it around from the top to the bottom, sup, um, supplementing it for any of the soil nails, we found that it was that middle support that was the most impactful on the factor of safety as a higher, uh, or sorry, substituting for a higher strength support type. So this is just summarizing what we saw before. Again, the density, uh, we could compare those if we were doing a constant, uh, cost analysis, but uh, I don't know that those are relevant here. So next here, just briefly, I wanted to go over the 3D LEM results found by Soil Vision. And this is the analysis procedure used in this case. So number one is the extrusion method. And I did go over this, but didn't, um, didn't include it for time's sake. But this is essentially just extending a 2D model in the third dimension. What we did do is the number two by creating a representative 3D model from the data. So the procedure that is followed is by using uh, Soil Vision's SB Designer product and adding the elevation data of each of the three layers. So we see those are here. And with those 2D profiles, you can then extend those layers and using some of the intersection tools, you can create 3D meshes that are then used to create a 3D volume for your analysis. So that's roughly the procedure that it follows. 
Now in SV slope, once you get to this 3D model, it follows a similar procedure to what we did in 2D. Uh, differences being that we used a multi-plane analysis. So this does a sweeping analysis across your 3D model. So that's what we see in this bottom right model is those, those white planes there. So those are each a slope stability analysis model. So the first one here is by doing, um, this is a replication roughly of the 2D designs that we went over. So if we're looking at section two, we see that this is the same pattern and spacing that was used in the 2D design and so on and so forth with the other three sections. So what we did is we analyzed the planes at each of the sections, so 100 feet, 160, 190, and 210. So those are the section points given for the 2D analysis, along with planes between such, so to analyze between the planes. The results that we found were, uh, were, were larger factors of safety compared to the 2D. Uh, so we have a circular failure over here between um, section one and section two. And this is an interesting point as well, because if, if we decide to make adjustments to the support design from one section to another, there may be that inconsistency may lead to um, some, a, a considerable, or something we need to consider, right? Because in this case, we have a different design from section one to section two, and therefore maybe that is leading to a lower factor of safety than if we considered it in, in three dimensions, we can see and we can design based on an entire slope rather than breaking it into chunks. So if we look at this next example here, this is an optimized solution for a 3D slope. And here what we've done is maintained a consistent spacing for the rock and PWR, the top two layers, as well as then an increased spacing for the rock layer below. And due to time constraints, I'm just going to quickly skip over this. Plaxis results, really quickly. Um, so very similar to our, the results ended up being quite similar and comparable to the soil vision results. Uh, what we see first is some of the displays offered in Plaxis show the forces and moments. These are fairly self-explanatory. One thing done for the Plaxis results was a concrete, um, a concrete facing was applied. And we can see on the right here that this facing actually does take some of the load and we can see the moment applied. So that's, that's a significant addition when doing the FEM analysis is that uh, those boundary conditions can be considered and can impact your, your results. Here's a, a parametric study done, and this was done using Python and Plaxis, so it's very easy. This took about an hour for my colleague to go through, but uh, fluctuating the number of nails used, fluctuating the number or, or the angle of inclination and starting point. So uh, we can go into these more de in more depth after if needed. Here's a comparison between soil vision and Plaxis results. So we have uh, a similar failure planes, you can see, um, at those 1.5 factor of safety criteria. The only thing to note different between these two is that Plaxis used, um, there was a, a higher density of soil nails used. So uh, that was one of the main differences between the, de the two designs. And a summary of the soil nail, or of the designs for sections of Plaxis. Now, some of the advantages and weaknesses for these two, so we're considering both LEM and FEM. Advantages of LEM being the fast solution times, and also very beneficial with LEM is the slip surface list that can be shown. So you can easily consider uh, the variety of different valid, invalid, and non-converged slip surfaces in LEM. And these can be, well, in, in soil vision, you can display these very easily. There's a, a readme file that then um, is connected to your, your display. And you can go through and you can actually look at each of those, those planes. So you can investigate all of these different types of planes. Some of the advantages in, in FEM analysis is a better representation of the detailed processes uh, using command history along with using Python in combination with, with Plaxis. So that's what my colleague did in, the, in that case. Then some of, the, some of the weaknesses, so part of LEM's one of the weaknesses in LEM is the lateral stress transfer is not accounted for. 
and the effect of anchored deformations is not considered. So something that uh, is obviously considered with FEM is the deformations. So if that's if that's beneficial or if that's a criteria that is needed to consider, um, then that's um, one, one of the benefits of, of, of an FEM analysis then. And just the last slide here, so the analysis limitations and further study. So one of the limitations being the ambiguity of kinematic rules of inadmissibility of trial slip surfaces. Again, this is something that I, I sort of led into in the last slide, talking about that ambiguity can be flushed out a little bit by looking at your, your list of trial slip surfaces and their shapes. Um, and this, is, this requires that engineering judgment, so a very important part of the design process. And there's just a few things there for further study. So if I, if I wanted to pick one, we talked a little bit about back analysis yesterday. So could we look at back analysis and how it can be further improved to estimate supports? So one thing within um, support design is you can specify a factor of safety and do a back analysis to see what forces your support design would need to satisfy that factor of safety. Now, one thing for further study, could we improve that to provide more information or to provide a more detailed support design requirement? Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you, Mitchell. So at this time, we'd like to open the floor to any questions to our providers or Dr. Wright and anybody online as well. Um, if you want to feed those questions online, we can get those to our providers and Dr. Wright also. Please use the microphones here so our online listeners can also hear your questions. It was a great presentation and I need to see the flexibility between all of the different uh, software platforms. And also interesting to see the difference in the results of the solutions are come up with. And, and um, again, this is kind of a statement than a question. It looks like the big underlying driver with the differences, the results in different solutions is what were the soils, what were the properties, what were the properties of the rock. Um, in Itasca, they made some judgments that 2,000 PSF was way too low for a competent rock without any C angle or fee angle, um, which I absolutely agree, and you know, get into the hook ground criteria and other things to determine rock mass um, criteria. But um, <clears throat> I guess if that's uh, in, in, um, the main statement I have is, is this, the tools are wonderful, and it'd be interesting to see um, maybe the next one to, to watch a model being set up in the different tools and look at how the differences between the, the different software platforms uh, allow. Um, creation of the models um, would be an interesting thing to see. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great presentation. I'm glad we set it up. <laughs> um, it really was. It was well put together. All of it was. Uh, I think you know, everybody would consider using multiple software packages to put stuff together to check. And, uh, with, with that being said, I mean, there is a lot of um, user training, right, that goes, kind of needs to go into this. And it's, it seems to be, to some degree, outpacing, <laughs> the technology is outpacing the actual training. Um, where, where does the panel see uh, that going? Like, what, as an industry, what should we be doing? I know individually you guys provide training for the software you sell, which is great. But where do you see the industry going? What do we need to be doing to better equip all the, all the users with the most appropriate information? Because it, it, it's growing, and uh, I mean, that's, that's, that was part of the reason for having this, was that uh, there just seems to be a lack of education on, on being able to use it. So, I was wondering if you could comment as to where you want it to be and what the industry could do. A any one of you, please. Go ahead. So, uh, yeah, if I may start. Uh, so, uh, I guess the first thing is basically introducing and incorporating more and more of this in the university education itself. 
and Itasca does have an ed educational partnership program. And I think most, most other people have too, uh, where we provide uh, free or highly discounted software for use for teaching. Because the sooner you expose uh, people who are going to be joining uh, the discipline to these methods, the, the better understanding they have at that stage. And then as they use it more and more over time, uh, they, would, they would actually be able to learn more uh, I think, yeah, the main, the main thing is just having more of a push for that to actually introduce these things, not just maybe starting at master's level that, that the thing used to be before, but kind of introducing this more at an undergraduate level as well towards the final year. So that, that would be the first step, I would say. Yeah, we, we absolutely agree with that, too, because it's, <clears throat> I think it, it's tough for practicing engineers to stay on top of the, the latest um, software design, right? So definitely, um, I think education in terms of uh, universities, like that's that's the way to go. I'll just add one more thing quickly. Um, I work with a lot of new users in the software, and it is a very technical program. Um, and what most people I find try to do is they try to learn it themselves right away, and um, there's certain certain learning curves that, that are uh, imped impediments to using the software very quickly and using it properly. And although it may take some time to get up to speed, what I've noticed in the feedback that I get is that training right off the start uh, does really have a significant impact on users' ability to uh, understand and work with the software and understand the results that they're getting. So not to say that everyone should have a uh, full-scale training as soon as you obtain a software like this, but um, I do know from my experience that when when users do have this training up front, and if it means that us and our peers can encourage this training, I know that it does uh, influence a more competent and, and higher level of, uh, of user success going forward with the software. And just some other comments. I mean, it's it's interesting to me to watch the industry because. Uh, a lot of consulting firms, I find there is a tendency to push all the numerical modeling to the most recent graduate from a bachelor engineering program simply because they're the most computer literate, right? And what they have, what you've just done, is you've actually pushed one of the more technically competent pieces of your work to the person that's, that's really good at geotech engineering, but may not have an education on numerical modeling, which is, I would view as a separate, a little bit of a separate piece. In other words, how many, at least in Canada, I think there's very limited exposure in the undergrad level to numerical modeling, slope stability foundations. You would get an introduction level at the bachelor's, but you're not really getting what I would say is good at numerical modeling until you, at least in Canada, you hit some of the master's level classes and you get a more in depth on how to do the modeling and you start hitting these issues. So it's, I think it's a little bit of an education to look at honestly how much education does a person have and if they, if they don't have an education on numerical modeling specifically in the use of these models, it is dangerous just to sit them down and plug and play on any piece of software and then expect them to have a reliable peer reviewed, uh, something that Steve Wright would, would uh, not poke holes in and go through this. Like that's a, it's a little bit, it's a tough scenario to put anybody into. And so I think either if they're, if they're, if you're putting somebody with a bachelor's on numerical modeling, I think they need severe uh, mentorship for the first while till they become uh, more competent. I mean, we're, we're trying to work on that. We've now got, exposure in Bentley to the Bentley Academy, which is more of a training program, and we're trying to leverage that to provide more education on numerical modeling. Um, but that's, uh, that's coming along, and that's part of the education process. On the practical side, the last comment I would say is, is and I think everybody would agree with this, and this is moving simple to complex is, is a really great way of approaching numerical modeling. Don't move on to, I mean, what we still see in industry is people going to consulting level problems that are quite complicated. Uh, even this has some, some interesting details to it that are not really beginner level topics. 
right? So start simple, understand that, and then add in the complexity one level at a time so that you understand what the contribution is to the answer of each level that you've added to your numerical model. So. Thank you, Murray. Dr. Wright, do you have a comment? Yeah, I guess I have to stand up as a token academician among much of this group. And before you shove this onto the academic institutions to do the training, let me tell you what my experience was. <laughs> At the University of Texas, we had a full semester course on shear strength alone. We had a full semester course on slope stability alone. I think a lot of people from outside the university assume since I'd written software, my students came out fluent in how to use the software. That wasn't the case at all. I wanted them to understand the fundamentals of slope stability. We gave them a little token experience at the end of the semester with running the sophomore, but there's a whole lot more you need to know about slope stability before you ever sit down to run a computer program. We had another course of which half of it was on CP. So there were two and a half semester courses we spent teaching the fundamentals. And if they don't understand the fundamentals, they shouldn't be using the software. So I understand the difficulty in getting people trained, but I, I don't think academia is going to solve that problem for you either. So it, it, it's a problem. It's something that needs to be addressed, but don't put it on academia because they've got their plates full in doing the job that I think they're best qualified to do, and that is teach the fundamentals. Thank you. Sebastian? I think it's it's amazing that you know you guys are sitting there and show us all these tools. Uh, just coming from a consultant point of view, the cost of this is kind of what concerns me. Twenty years ago, we were doing this basically for free. This kind of design, software-wise, we have PC stable that you know it was basically free. We could contribute if we wanted. We have gold nail that it was also free to do it around. Then I guess in the mid 2000s we went more into let's say a slide, single license user, $1,500. The, the standard cost was $2,000. Now we're, you know, end of this decade, we are looking, you know, not referring to any particular one of you, but we are looking 4,000 for perpetual license. Uh, so, I mean, you can see the trend of where I'm going, free, four grand. Uh, and also, and I have to be careful with my words because I'm working on discounts with many of you right now, but where do you see the cost of us. I mean, what's your target regarding, uh, it's a business, and, and I want to maintain that clear, but where do you see the structure of this? I mean, are we going to jump into a system that is more, we're going to pay you every year, you know, just for a lease, and then we go through that, uh, and then you are going to keep advancing all this. And also, how do you see that is sustainable as a consultant to be able to own all of your software, you know, if we are going into this? into this high price. So, that's it. That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, but when you say free, um, I guess for you the software is free, right? You're maybe using Excel, but how much time is it taking your engineers? And how many iterations or how many different scenarios can you consider? So it depends, like, I think either way you're paying for it. You know, either you're paying in terms of the time or the engineers, um, the, the level of analysis you're getting. Um, I mean, you can do it by hand, and you can do maybe one slip surface in, in an hour, and, or you can do all of these different scenarios in an hour. Or you, do, you can do it in 3D, you can get 20 cross-sections done in half a day. So. Let me just put a caveat on that. But I'm, I'm talking 10 years ago, I was using your same, you know, slide file, and it was taking me the same amount of time to do the design that I'm doing these days. But it was costing me just perpetual license $1,500 compared to now, and I, I'm hoping I'm not ruining my discount with you, but I'm just going into it. I understand it's a business, and you guys put a lot of resources on this and a lot of investment. So you need to get paid for that. That's the nature of the business. I mean, otherwise, we will not be here. We all live because of this profession. But I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking is, 
the sustainability of the model as a whole, because then as consultants, we cannot just buy all the software you know, as the costs keep going up. And, and I guess the point that I'm going is, the soil nail walls that I was designing 10 years ago, honestly, are not that different to the ones that I'm doing today. The final result, that's kind of my, my line. <laughs> we're getting, uh, I mean, we're, we're going to the place where it used to be, I would say, software development was hiring one geotech PhD that knew how to program Fortran, and you'd write a piece of code. And that was simple, and I would say that there's been a progression that every software company has gone through, really, is that, well, not only are salaries increasing, but the expectation of software and the convenience of it is the high, there's a high expectation nowadays that the software will look, have a flashy interface, it will give the right answer, and it will work in maybe 3D, just to pick three things randomly. Well, now what that's resulted is you have a whole team that's just working on the solver, the, the Fortran guys or the C++ guys. Then you have a whole other team that's all working on the user interface to make it convenient and pretty and, and look good. Then you want the 3D to look good. And so that requires actually, for us to do that, I'm just speaking personally, that required hiring a whole team of, that's just good at graphics programming, for example. And you have to go recruit them and you have to go hire them. Well, that cost ultimately, if the industry wants that, has to be translated onto the cost of the software. So. There's, there's fundamental things that just have to get passed along is all I would say, and every company makes their own decision about how they're gonna pass that on between the number of users and the, the value they're getting. And that's, that's gonna just come out in, in the wash, I would say. Um, what the fundamental underlying principle is that software has to be maintained. If you, if you have, I mean, the good old days of free software where a grad student wrote it and then they threw it out on the market. Um, Hopefully those days are gone, actually, because the problem is, is the, there's very little value in an instantaneous piece of software. Software is a living, breathing child, just like any of your children that you have. It requires constant care and maintenance and uh, constant effort and attention to keep it not only giving the right answer continually, but developing new features. So you, you've incurred a cost and the, the business piece, I mean, I'll just give you a little example. Every software company struggles with it, I think. What, what do you price it for? I mean, if there's not a great answer sometimes. I mean, and some of the early versions, for example, people said, well, we would, uh, the comment was is that we would like this software to be half as much. Um, that comment was made. So what we did is to, to explore that is we went out and we, we realized, well, what they're asking for, we can't actually provide. Like, if I cut the price in half, I can't actually employ enough programmers to be interested in working on the software for, and basically the software will just die, is, will be the result. Then you have no software. So we pulled off features, and we came out with a version that had half as many features and released it. So we had a half price and a full price version. And can you guess which piece of software people kept on buying? Everybody bought the full price version because they wanted the features. So sometimes it's very hard as software companies to try to filter through the comments and try to, um, in our defense, understand what the user is saying in terms of what we can deliver on a budget to customers. So maybe that sheds some light on the, the, the things. We do agonize over that as a, as a daily basis, and I'm, we're, we're venturing into the business model throughout no, the technical that's... model of, of running software companies. But, no, no, but, but there, it, there is okay. a lot of thought that goes into that. To, and, to and, and I don't want you to take my comments the wrong way. I mean, I, as I said, I understand all that cost. Has to be done, and I agree with you. There is some software that we have seen dying right. in the past, uh, especially those that were developed by, let's say, by a professor that's or something like that, and, and they were not maintained. And I agree with you. I mean, the Software is like a, like a child has to be continued and the effort has to be put and, and obviously that's gonna come with a cost. And, and I'm not being down on you. I mean, I understand that cost has to be passed and it's a business. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's all I have to say, but 
No, thank you very much. Just, just don't get the negative <laughs> image because I'm still buying your software. So. All right. Uh, that, thank you, gentlemen. I, I think we got through on that. We got some questions piling up here, so I think we're going to move along in the interest of time. Um, let's go to Gerald real quick, if you could. Yes, sir. Um, you talked, all, all of you talked about more features on your software. Software is getting more powerful. At the same time, though, I see the risk of button pushers. Users that just sit behind the software package, put stuff in there, they really don't understand anymore what the solution, what a good solution should be. I heard Steve Wright saying earlier that even the professionals originally came up with the solution, it was not really the right solution, and then start moving again. What are you including in your software to make people think after they see a result come in from the computer program that they really think and analyze that this, is this the right solution and to avoid this button pushing process that I see happening way too often? Okay, um, I'm a business technical person at Rock Science. Uh, what we do, my job, part of my job is to find models published in papers, actual models that the companies provide for us, and to show the users step by step how to use the software for practical purposes. The models that they were done, they are designed, and then now you want to use the features of our software to do the same thing. Uh, how you can do that. Part of it is a, it's a self-learning procedure, but normally what we do, uh, we have uh, trainings uh, for the users, same model, I start from a scratch, similar what I do uh, at work, and uh, I go a step by step with them to show them, okay, these are the features that we have, and these are the final results, we want to reach that final result. So um, we take them through the procedure. We just don't add features uh, and tell you, okay, just go and use them. This is now how we work. And the other thing is uh, we provide examples, tutorials, a lot of examples, practical examples on the website. And they can go and simulate the same thing. The procedure is there, and they can learn. And actually, this is the answer to the first question that if you want to learn one of any of these software packages, uh, if you have engineers at your company to teach them how to use it, it's better to start with the previous project uh, that were done with Excel sheets, with the other software packages, and ask them to do the same procedure, to the, do the same example. That's the only way, because this is how I myself learn the software. I start from a, a practical example, I sit and try different features, and that's how I learn. It's not just give you the software and so go ahead and use the software. It's not how uh, any of these companies, they work. Thanks, Tina. I'm gonna, if I could, Dr. Wright, I'm gonna let some of our online participants ask a question. So we have a question, we have a question from Juan Carlos Zamudio. He wants to know about comparing the 3D factor of safety with the typical 1.5 obtained from a 2D analysis. Um, he wants to know if there's the same confidence level in the with a 1.5 in a 3D analysis as there is with a 1.5 factor of safety in a 2D analysis, or should that be scaled? Uh, I would just respond to similar comments that I did yesterday, is that really the, the two key principles, your 2D your factors of safety that you have right now are developed in the context of a 2D analysis history. So that's, that's established. Uh, that being said, what you're doing in a 2D analysis is you're actually representing 3D world in a certain way and you're doing an analysis that has really a 2D factor of safety and then an unknown factor of safety, which is your difference between 2D and 3D. That's been there all the time, even if you didn't realize it was there. So I would say that the answer to this is to push towards the more 3D realistic factor of safety, but then under, allow that to give you understanding of what is the difference between 2D and 3D, and then use professional judgment. Once you know more your true factor of safety, what you've been doing historically all along, and allow then it becomes a professional judgment. Uh, issue to comment on. 
Yeah, if I if I may just add, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it essentially comes down to uh, the understanding again. I mean, if you are modeling something in 2D, which is exactly the same section repeating over, and then you model the same thing in 3D, and you are getting different factors of safety from both, then there is something not quite right. I mean, you, that's a red flag right there. And the the 3D factor of safety is the actual right solution if you are modeling the geometry correctly. The, the place where 2D actually comes into picture is if you want to get a solution faster, basically, you don't have want to model the whole geometry, but you have to be aware that the assumption you are making of plane strain does hold. And usually, if it's something like an open pit slope, which is uh, curving in one way, I mean, you will get low, higher factors of safety in 3D. But if it's something like a nose region forming, you will get lower factors of safety with 3D, which is actually lower. So depending on what kind of problem you are trying to solve, you have to you have to make that engineering call is whether 2D is a good assumption or not. But eventually, 3D is the real thing. But the question is whether you can get away with using 2D because it's a fair assessment of the problem. So. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Next question, Roman. The next question comes from Neil Belk. He wants to know, uh, Dr. Wright, do you know if Hayward Baker evaluated their original design using a bilinear soil nail software like SNAP2 or SNAIL? The answer to that's real simple. No, I don't know. I, I think John told me they used, uh, may have used SNAIL on that, but it, it, it was also, I think, fairly early on in the design at the point where I got it and they were suspicious of the results they were getting. So I'm not sure if they used other software or not. I don't know if John's online and can answer that. I'm not sure if we know if John's online. Okay, John's not online. But great. So the next question comes from Bernardo. Uh, he would like to know um, from all of the presenters, uh, what recommendations do you give in order to choose the right type of mesh uh, and density for the specific problem you're looking at? Um, because it's a parameter that can make an analysis get very slow or get unconverged solutions. So is it just user experience or is there a, is there a basis for selecting the correct type of mesh? Okay, so uh, yeah, one of uh, one parameter, one of the aspects is yes, user experience, and some of it actually comes from the physics of the problem as well. If you're trying to model a failure uh, slip surface, like if you're using a finite element or finite difference type approach, you want to make sure you have at least six, seven zones spanning across uh, the total mass soil mass that's failing. And then the rule of thumb always is start with this general guideline of six, seven zones, and then increase the mesh size. Uh, or not, I shouldn't say mesh size, increase the mesh, mesh density, and then check if your results are changing. I mean, if your results do not change by changing the mesh size, uh, then you are basically good. You don't need any finer resolution. So the rule of thumb is always start course and then densify it, and then see if you get any difference in results. If you don't, then you're, you're good. And some, to some extent, the user experience is, is basically that. Over time, you realize, depending on a type of problem, roughly how many zones you would need across a typical length scale that matters in the problem. Uh, the recommendation for mesh is uh, to have a better speed, and this is what we teach at our workshops. Is. Uh, for example, in this uh, particular uh, case, for the rock region, you don't have to have a very small mesh. You can have a larger mesh because the answer is not go through it. But there are options in the software packages that you can refine the regions that you are more interested. So if you have a reinforcement, if you have an excavation or something like that, you can easily refine that region while you keep the other sides of the problem uh, that have la a larger mesh. So that's a general recommendation. But for the size, we don't give any specific recommendation. Uh, I would agree with that. There's a lot of rules you can get into mesh quality in FEM as far as your angles of your triangles or quads, and you can delve into that. But, and, and maybe the software might spit out quality of mesh indicators, but still it comes back to just make it denser and see if your answer changes. 
is the short and, and easy way to determine that. In LEM, I would just say that you're really talking about slices. And we've long since, I think, proven in 2D that there not many slices are required to get a reasonable answer. I mean, you're kind of talking in that 50 to 70, maybe up to 100 slices. And does it matter after that? No, it usually doesn't matter. Uh, what's important to realize in between 2D and 3D is that in 2D, when you develop your slices, you slice at every material breakpoint. Uh, in other words, you find every intersection on your geometry and you put a slice, a sub-slice there, and your slices are not uniform in 2D. Um, in 3D, you can't do that because fundamentally, to put a whole bunch of square columns together and to have all of them a different size doesn't geometrically work. So there is a small backing off that we do is we just make every column the same size in 3D and experience has found that yes we need more columns in 3D than 2D, quite a few more, but it's, the solution is generally not sensitive to, uh, like doesn't not need to be subdivided in 3D and so that's a simplifying assumption we made for 3D LEM. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wright, you have a comment? Yes, I have something that I'll pass on to all the software guys because I think you could do a better job on this. And that is, in, in my software, and I'm not promoting my software, but we have between two and 300 messages, depending on, they vary from caution to error to warning, that help the user know if there's something going wrong. In fact, a number of years ago, we put in a caution message had to do with whether there was tension in the analysis, there was an office of the Corps of Engineers with the higher level people would not accept an analysis if it had those kind of messages in it. So they also allow somebody at a higher level to look at, this, to look at a, an analysis and say, hey, what does this mean? You need to answer that. So I, I think you could do a better job of providing more types of warning and caution messages. I know it takes a lot of effort. It doesn't change the final result, the solution. So we're talking about more time and more programming, but I think it's very helpful to have those messages in there because one of the things I found with those is when, when a user gets that message and doesn't know what it means, they'll start asking questions and find out something. So it, it, it aids the learning. So I think you could all do a better job of putting in more of those kind of messages, also provide more tables that show detailed in intermediate results from the solution that the user can look at. I know there's a lot of effort in doing this, but I, I would challenge you all to do a better job on that if you can. That's a, that's a great comment, and I would just I would just say that we've, we've had similar experience to that, is we've had situations where it throws out certain trial slip surfaces, and the user asks why, and they're, they're worried about it, and the problem was in that state is, is we then to explain why we got into a very technical discussion about rules of kinematic admissibility that actually really confused the client and, and they didn't because they don't have the technical knowledge to understand the physics and the history of how the method was developed. So that's the challenge I think we face is how do you actually accurately convey to a client, say it's the US Army Corps of Engineers, then how do you convey to them without getting into a, a very deep and involved technical discussion of that, yeah, there's a warning here, but it's it's really okay. And it's a minor, like that's that's a bit of the challenge. Maybe to just throw it back on you as the, yeah. You, you're, you're educating the user by this. You're getting them to ask questions that they might not otherwise ask. Yeah, and so, so I think that's the way it helps. It's yeah. more work on the part of the, of the software people because they, then they call you and you've got to explain what it means. So I realize there's some effort involved here, but I think it really helps in having the user understand what's going on in the software. All right, thank you everybody. Unfortunately, that's time. Um, those of you here, if you have any other further questions for the providers, for Dr. Wright, please feel free to sit with them over lunch or in the networking. Thank you to everybody online for the webinar, um, all the questions and your attention. Uh, this is really great, and we look forward to doing it again. Thanks.
So hi everybody online, this is Mary Ellen again, and um, I hope you enjoyed the, the webinar. We're, we're really interested in receiving your feedback, so you should receive a survey after the, um, the webinar concludes. If you could fill that out and let us know how we can make things better, um, that would be great. And um, if you have any other questions, email them over to me and we'll try to see if the panelists will answer them. And again, thanks for being part of our S3 conference in, in Minneapolis, and um, we look forward to continuing this series. So uh, keep a lookout for more invitations to join our future webinars. If you have any questions, you can always email me. Again, it's Mary Ellen at DFI, and I'm melarge at dfi.org. Thank you. Oh, and your PDH certificates will be coming in about two weeks. So um, you know, don't have to worry about those. Those will be automatically generated. They'll come from our system, and you'll get them in two to three weeks. So thank you.